Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome to the Honest Youth Pastor YouTube channel, the channel that helps believers use biblical discernment in all aspects of life. Today, we're going to be doing that in one of my favorite ways. Welcome to the channel if you're new here. Each week, we look at a variety of different sermons from a variety of different pastors, usually submitted by you. Today, that is the case. The sermon, I know you've already seen the title, you've already seen the thumbnail, so you already know, but Keith Foskey was suggested actually quite a while back. I think it was actually even before... I interviewed him about his church history class that he does through his church. But today we're going to look at one of his sermons. Now, a lot of you probably know him from Conversations with a Calvinist. He has this very interesting mix of humor and serious. Like, it's, it's either on one or the other sides of the spectrum there. Today we're going to look at a sermon. It was suggested. I have not, just to be clear, have not seen the sermon, not sure, uh, I trust that it's going to be good just because I know uh, the content he puts out. So I think this is going to be a really interesting one to look at, though I haven't watched any of it yet myself. Now, if you're new here, each week I want to provide you with the full sermon without my commentary to it. So if you want to look at the full sermon without anything that I'm about to say, you can check it out in the link below. Also down there, a few other things. A few other things down there is going to be a free sermon review guide that you can download, as well as, if you want to help us out and support us here at this channel, ways to do that, either by buying merch or supporting over on Patreon and getting access early to the sermon reviews, as well as the making of a minister videos as we produce. Produce those as well. Today, though, we're going to be looking at Keith Foskey, a sermon from uh, Sovereign Grace Family Church, which is the church that he pastors down in Florida. And if you're new here, we always look for three different things in a sermon, just like this sticker here on there. We look to see if they read the text, do they exegete the text using context and culture to bring up the application, and do they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Those are the three things that we look at. So let's go ahead and get into it. We're actually starting this particular video, if you do want to start where the sermon starts, you are going to be starting at 37 minutes into the video. The video itself uh, is an hour and 40 minutes long. Before this, there were other uh, selective readings from people in his congregation, and now uh, Keith seems to be getting up to give the sermon. So let's go ahead and hop into it, see what Keith uh, has to say here today, and see what we can learn from this sermon and to see if he does the three things we look at each week in these reviews. So let's get to it. Take your copy of God's Word and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and... Okay, so he's going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, one of the things that I always tell you guys to do, and I, I've, I've really failed the last two times to have this uh, up on the screen for you, but I try to put the Bible app uh, up beside so we can kind of work through the things uh, that the pastor is saying. Again, that's not worked for me. So just go ahead and turn to, I think he said 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He may say it again uh, as we dive into sort of his sermon for today. And go to verse 7. Before we read, I just have a few introductory comments. In 1946, some Bedouin teenagers were tending their flocks near the northwest shore of the Dead Sea. One of the young shepherds tossed a rock into a cave, and he heard from within the cave the echoing of a smashing sound and so he and his friends went to investigate the sound and found a collection of large clay pots they stood about as tall as they did and when they began to investigate within those pots they found that there were some leather scrolls some papyrus some vellum but they noted that these might be worth some money. So they went and got their associates. They came back and investigated. And lo and behold, they had found one of the greatest treasures of 
biblical archaeology that has ever been discovered, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And over the next few years, many archaeologists and treasure hunters went and searched out and found that there were actually ten more caves that had these collections of pots, and within these pots they found almost a thousand manuscripts. And included in those manuscripts were copies of the Old Testament. And those Old Testament copies were valuable not only because they were not discovered before, but because at that time in history, in 1946, the oldest copies of the Old Testament that we possessed were from around the year 900. It's called the Masoretic Text. But these texts took our Old Testament back a thousand years. Because Now, one thing, uh, there's a couple things I actually want to say here. The first is that I'll leave a link below for um, Apologetics Canada. Actually, uh, Wes Huff and his associates over at Apologetics Canada have come out with uh, a series talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls and the importance of them and how they help us understand and trust the Bible more. Uh, and it's their free videos. You can, all you got to do is sign up and then you can watch them. And they are very good quality, um, the two that I've seen. So you should go ahead over there. I'll leave that, again, link in the description below. I just want to give that out there for a resource if you're wanting to dig into this topic more. It's very interesting, um, but it's there for you. It's available. It's free. Secondly, I think what he's doing here is really helpful and important. Um, oftentimes, what I'll say is that I think pastors should enter into the sermon, right, giving some context on the text itself, which he, he very well may do here in a minute. I don't know. But what he's doing here is giving us some history to the very scriptures that we hold in our hands when we, when we do our own Bible reading, when we're in church. And sometimes, oftentimes now, people just simply don't know where the text came from. They know that they have a Bible. They know they're readily available. And oftentimes, if you ask the average Christian today within the church, where did this come from? How was it compiled? How can you trust it? They just can't tell you. They just don't know. And so like Keith giving this little bit of an intro here, I think is very helpful. It's something that, again, not everybody has to do, but it is something that I think benefits, um, and I'm sure it connects to his overall point here, but even if it didn't, it benefits the congregation to understand that the Dead Sea Scrolls are very, very valuable in regards to the history they give us in relation to the scriptures. And not only that, the verification that the scriptures had not been altered um, via what they had at the time the Dead Sea, Scrolls, Dead sea Scrolls were discovered and what the Dead Sea Scrolls say. These things line up. And that, that was a huge thing at the time when they were found. Because these texts had been written somewhere around 100 to 200 B.C. So it took our copies that we had of the Old Testament back a thousand years. And so to say that what was discovered in 1946 was a treasure of biblical archaeology would be saying the bare minimum. It is absolutely an understatement to say that that is a treasure. Well, I tell this story as an introduction because today we're going to read a text where Paul says something about a treasure in a clay pot. But the treasure that he's talking about is not the written Word of God, not manuscripts from a thousand or two thousand years ago. The treasure that he is going to talk about is the knowledge of God's glory in Jesus Christ, which we carry around in all of us who believe in him. Paul says, we are the jars of clay, and within us we carry the great treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So with that, let us stand together and read the text. We're going to read from the English Standard Version, and we're going to read verses 7 to 15. But we have this treasure 
in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that, as, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. May we pray. Now he's about to pray. I just want to note really quick. I know that for some of you that are watching this, it is a normal thing that you just watch, right? It was a, a standing for the reading of God's word. You read through a big chunk of it. And then what my guess, if I had to guess, is that Keith is going to work us through this uh, probably point by point, line by line. If I had to guess, he may do it in some sort of variation of that, but that is probably what's going to happen. Now, I just want to be really clear that that is not, unfortunately, how a lot of churches do it. So it depends on where I'm going to move this real quick because that's ah, bugging me. All right, here we go. So depending on what kind of church you attend, right, th there is a varying level of similarity to this. Now, I don't know if I'd say there's like a right way or a wrong way, but one of the things that we have here is very, it's very clear that what we're talking about right now is this scripture. It is the scriptures that we are referring to. It's the scriptures that are the foundation of what we're talking about. There are no you know, uh, humorous stories being told. And I think what's interesting, knowing sort of the content that Keith puts out outside of him just preaching in the pulpit, is that he would probably be very able to do that, but he doesn't in this particular uh, this, this setting because it is the preaching of God's word. And so it's just interesting to point that out. I know some of you guys, you attend churches that, that look exactly like this, and you're like, yeah, this is normal. I, the more sermon reviews I do, the more obvious it becomes <laughs> that a lot of people don't just go to churches in which the Word of God is plainly read, plainly proclaimed, and explained, and then applied. Uh, there's a lot of theatrics. There's a lot of circus tricks. There's a lot of things that are try to get your attention. Um there's a lot of pastors for whatever reason that, um, that try to use some sort of engagement hook as if they were trying to make a YouTube video or a TikTok video or something to make sure that you just like, you don't fade off into the distance. And that is, um, actually more distracting than just reading the word of God. So I, again, I, I, I know it sounds simple. It sounds sort of silly to even point that out. But the reality is that um, in the church growth movement era or on the other side of it, this is becoming more and more rare what we see here from Keith, which is just opening with the word of God, reading it plainly, and then my guess to be, we're just going to get right into it. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word, and your word deserves to be proclaimed, every single word of it. So I pray, O oh God, that today as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study, as we continue the study of God's Word, I pray that you would keep me from error. For, Lord, I am a fallible man. I'm capable of preaching error, and I don't want to for the sake of your name, for the sake of my conscience, and for the sake of your people. Lord, I pray that your Word would be proclaimed rightly, that your Spirit would apply the truths to our hearts, for, Lord, if the Spirit is not within me, if the Spirit is not among us, if the Spirit is not doing the teaching, then everything today will be for a waste. So, Lord, I pray for the strength and power of the Holy Spirit to preach your word aright. And, Lord, if there are those who are here who do not know Christ, I pray 
that today they would see the great treasure of the Lord Jesus Christ, that He is in fact the pearl of great price, that He is the one that we should be willing to forsake all to seek out, that He is the one utmost worthy of praise and adoration. He is the only one who can save. And Lord, if there are those who are here who do believe, and I know there are, I pray that this would be a time of edification, a time of instruction, maybe, Lord, a time of rebuke and correction. For we all, Lord, are in these jars of clay, this weak flesh, and we need to be corrected and encouraged. So we pray for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I just want to point out, I, I hate doing this because I feel like it is, it's not the point of these sermon reviews. But you can tell... You can tell when somebody takes what they're doing in the pulpit seriously. You just can. There are people that are performers, that are clowns, that are not qualified to be in the pulpit. Just That's just plain and simple. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be the arbiter of all qualifiers of a pastor. But the reality is that you can you can tell usually. And the prayer is a really good way to do that. And if you just listen to what Keith said in his prayer, his goal is to hopefully edify, rebuke, correct the believers, hopefully draw unbelievers to repentance and faith in Jesus. He doesn't want to preach unless the Spirit's doing the teaching because he knows he can be in error. He doesn't want to be in error. He wants to preach the Word of God faithfully. And all of that is being said um, in, a, in a way that is not only a prayer to God, that that he preaches faithfully, but really also in a way that reminds the congregation of the heart of their pastor. And right. So I'm not like, I'm not saying it always has to, it always has to sound like that. I'm just saying that I think that that says a lot, like from the get go about what your intent is, where your heart's at, what you're doing. But anyway, I'm talking a lot. We got a lot more in this sermon. I'm sure let's get back to it. We have been in our study of 2 Corinthians now for several months, and for those of you who are visiting with us, or maybe you are new, this is our method of preaching. In general, we go through books of the Bible, going one passage at a time, one section at a time, seeking to understand it, and part of the benefit of that is we get to maintain the context of the book as we study rather than simply jumping from one passage in one book to another passage in another book to another passage in another book, which tends to break up the continuity of our study. I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to say it. The right way to do it. Again, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'm not saying topical preaching is bad. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that expositional preaching is better. And we have been learning in 2 Corinthians that this is Paul's most autobiographical epistle. Meaning that it speaks more about him personally than any of his other epistles. He, he is defending his ministry against those who would question his integrity. We've seen this in chapter 1 when they said that he was suffering. And his suffering indicated somehow that he was not really God's man. How, how can God's man go through all these times of trouble and suffering? We saw him accused of vacillating in chapter 2 where they were accusing him because he didn't do exactly as he said he was going to do. His plans changed. They said, well, look at this. Here's a man who can't be trusted. His yes is not yes and his no is not no. He addressed those who demanded letters of commendation in chapter 3. Those who would demand from him some kind of credentialing. And he said to the Corinthian church, you in fact are our letter of recommendation. We, we planted the church. We, we brought you the gospel. You are in fact our letter of commendation. So when we come to chapter 4, we see that Paul is continuing to defend himself against this onslaught of accusation 
And he begins and ends the chapter with the same phrase. I want you to simply notice this. He begins and ends the chapter with the phrase, We do not lose heart. He says that in chapter 4, verse 1. And he says it again in chapter 4, verse 16. So that phrase, we do not lose heart, is really the theme of this chapter. He's saying that he's not willing to manipulate his message. He's not willing to alter his teaching. He's not willing to manipulate or trick his hearers. He is not going to give in. He is going to continue to move forward even as he's faced by those who use unscrupulous ministry tactics. And even as he is faced by those who will not hear and believe. He says there are those who won't hear and believe what he has to say because a veil is over their hearts. But even in the midst of this, he will continue to preach Christ. And in verse 7, Paul points to his own weaknesses. Okay. So I just want to catch you up because I just don't... Again, the more sermon reviews I do, the more uh, feedback I get, the more DMs I read, uh, the more emails that we get because of these sermon reviews, the more it's pretty apparent to me that a lot of people don't attend churches that preach in this way that Keith has described, verse by verse, expositionally through it, doing basically what he just did. I mean, um, giving context to everything that's happened that's led up to chapter four. Now, again, if you've been there at his church, you've you've already heard all that. This is a very brief overview of something you've already heard, um, but it's been really it's very beneficial, right? Because now they've been walked through verse by verse what's going on. So when you get to chapter four, you already know what's been said before. You've kind of really unpacked it. You've really walked through it. You understand what the, who the church is, who who, who Paul is, how, why he's talking to them the way that he, that he is, why he's writing them, the conversation that's happening, why it's happening, and so then we get to verse 7 here in chapter 4. And so he's caught us up and now he's going to dig into it. Now, again, like he said, like I just have to... The reason that this is a good way to preach... Now, it takes longer. It does. It takes a lot longer. You're going to go through a whole book. That's going to take a while. I think he said he'd been in it for months, right? This takes some effort. (laughs) This takes some dedication. This takes some real study. But the benefits of it are, as he said, you see it all within the context that it's written. For some reason, Christians approach the Bible in a way that you would approach no other book, right? You're not going to open a novel and start in chapter three and then read into that couple verses or or a couple sentences, um, whatever you want, and try to pull an application through it because no one reads a novel like that. No one reads a letter like that. Um, I know not a lot of people write letters anymore. Let's say you get an email. You don't skip down to the second paragraph, third line in an email, read that, and then try to deduce what the entire thing's about or try to pull out some application or instruction from it. You don't do that. So why do we do that with the Bible? Why do we do that with the Bible? And so when we preach expositionally through this text, as Keith has already said, it it keeps the context. You understand what's going on. And so what he's very briefly done, like incredibly briefly done, is summed up this letter for us all the way up to where we're at. And now he's going to unpack the rest of it, right? So this is the, again, when he said rebuke, correct, encourage, that, according to Paul, when he writes to Timothy, is what the scriptures are for. And that, when we work through the scriptures, is what should happen. So here we go. And he spends the remainder of this chapter explaining how God's power is what overcomes in his weakness, in his affliction, in his confusion, even in his persecution. God's power is what will overcome. Why? Because one of the accusations against Paul is that his suffering means that somehow God's not at work with him. That his affliction is somehow proof that God is not pleased with him. Somehow his struggles are proof that God is not using him and Paul contends the opposite he says my weakness is actually proof that God is at work in me because God can take the weak and give them his strength and through his strength they will move forward 
And so this is the context of chapter 4. So now I want to dig in a little bit more to some of the particulars. One of my favorite areas of study, Brother Mike and I were talking about this the other night because we're getting ready to we're getting ready to teach hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the art and science of studying the Bible, and we're we have an academy here at Sovereign Grace, and our next academy class is going to be hermeneutics, and Brother Mike and I are going to be co-teaching that class. I just want to I want to stop real quick. I like I said before at the beginning, I interviewed Keith because he has a church history class that they also teach. I know not everybody can do this. But I would highly highly encourage you if you are a pastor of a church to find a way to do this. We just got done at my church uh, preaching, not preaching through, but teaching through how to read the Bible. I'm sure it was not as in-depth as as Keith and this guy named Mike are going to do. I'm sure it was elementary school compared to what they're going to do. But it was really just walking the congregation through like, all right, well, how should we approach the text? Um, you know, uh, what are some tools you can use to help you approach the text better? What are some ways that we unintentionally read ourselves into the text sometimes when we shouldn't do that? What are the things and keywords and key phrases and kind of, you know, how, how should we go and approach a verse and by reading out and getting the context, like all of the very just simplistic things that are very often overlooked. Uh, I was surprised, and maybe if you're a pastor and you do this, you'll be surprised at how many of the people that you assume know how to read the scripture maybe don't. And it's not like, it's not that they're dumb or it's their fault. It's just they've never been taught how to do it. Like they, as I say often, as a pastor preaches the scripture is how the congregation is going to assume they should read it. And so if you're preaching it in, in a way that you're reading yourself into it, that's how they're going to assume they should do it. If you're teaching it as Keith is here, expositionally working through it, looking at the context, the culture, what's it saying? How does that then apply, right? Those things then teach them how to do it. Keith is really taking it a whole step further uh, in a way in which he's saying, okay, well, we're going to get down to the nitty gritty with it. Hey, if you want to want to know how to do that, sign up. I say all that to say, that's amazing. And secondly, if you're able to do that at your church, you 100% should. It's gonna. It's going to be of so much benefit to you to do that for your people. And as we were having our discussion and having our meeting about the class, we began to talk about the fact that one of our favorite parts of study is to investigate the way that biblical writers use language. And if you want to call me a grammar nerd, I won't be offended because I think it's somehow true. I've always enjoyed how language can be used to make certain points. And there is an important form of language which we need to recognize in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. In Greek it is called a henna clause, and I don't want to get too much into that because I don't want to bring any confusion to you. But a henna clause is basically a clause of purpose. A clause of purpose. It gives the purpose of something in writing you have main clauses and you have subordinate clauses which are often connected by some form of conjunction and that conjunction in this sense is what we would call a purpose conjunction see i'm doing it i said i wasn't going to do it sorry let me give it to you in layman's terms you all know john 3 16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that's the first clause so that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the subordinate clause. And it is connected by the word henna, which is the purpose connecting word. And it's translated so that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that. This is the purpose that he did it. This is the reason why he did it. So that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. See how it works and how it's connected. 
and why that matters. Well, in this particular text, we actually have four of the henna clauses. We have one in verse 7, one in verse 10, one in verse 11, and one again in verse 15. And so what I see... One of the things that I, I want to say real quick, because I, I, can, I, I know that there's going to be one or two people that watch this video and go, oh my goodness, this is so boring. This is so dry. Is this like an English class? Like, I want to be inspired when I'm at church. I want to be excited. Um, there's an enormous difference between being hyped up and being taught, right? So just because I'm already known for picking on Stephen Furtick, I'll just pick on him again. There's a huge difference about generating some energy about something, but it being vapid and not really meaning anything, right? There's a recent clip that went around, and by recent, I mean a few weeks ago. So internet timeline, like it was years ago, but in real time, it was a few weeks ago, in which he was going on and on very passionately about a, a title that is found within the Bible about the two blind men are healed. And he went on for a long time about how it should be changed and yada, yada, yada. And it, it doesn't even matter because it wasn't originally a part of the text. It was just this point that he wanted to really dig in on. And he's very passionate when he's talking about it. And he's really getting the audience hyped. But at the end of the day, it was nothing. It was empty. It was just it was meaningless. There's a huge difference between that you're being real hyped up and you're not actually learning something versus actually learning something here and being tuned in enough to understand that not only can you learn something in the moment that he's teaching it, but he's actually giving you a tool to help you learn, continue to learn as you read the scripture. There's a whole bunch of these clauses that he's talking about within the scriptures and you'll run across them often. And so the idea, there's a huge difference between hyped up and excited and ready to go and full of energy and just energized versus being handed a very useful tool that make the scriptures come alive. Like they're already alive. It helps you understand how alive the scriptures are. And when you know how to read the Bible, like the way that it is intended to be read, you can dive in more. You can understand it better. You understand how to get out of it what it is intended to get out of it and then therefore apply it. And so I just really try to caution people in an age of like hype and excitement and like tweetable phrases that are easy to get hyped up about with a mob around you that are all like, woo, look for the meat and not just the sugar. See, when I see that happening over and over again in this short of amount of time, what I recognize here is that Paul is trying to identify to us the purpose for these things. And what he's going to show us, he's going to show us the purpose of our weakness. He is going to show us the purpose of our struggles and our afflictions. He's going to show us the purpose of why we seem to always be struggling against the world. And he's going to show us that all of this has an ultimate purpose, and that is to extend the grace of God and increase thanksgiving to God. You see, this is what we see in this chapter when we take a step back and we see Paul is talking about the purpose of our struggles, the purpose of our affliction. Might I say, as I said in the title, it's the purpose in everything. Do you believe everything happens for a purpose? Now, I really want you to step back and ask. Because this is one of my biggest issues when we talk about Reformed theology. Because I am convinced that those who do not hold to a robust Reformed theology have to come at some at some point, a conclusion that some things just happen for no reason. That some things happen for no purpose. And beloved, that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that there's no such thing as purposeless anything. But that God has, and this is what the confessions say, that God has from all eternity ordained all that comes to pass. That doesn't mean you're not responsible for your sin. That doesn't mean that you don't make choices. That doesn't mean that you're not engaged in the world around you. But what it does mean is God has a purpose even in your actions which are opposed to Him. 
You see, God has a purpose in all of it. That's key. It really is. This is one of the things. I, I, people want to talk about purposeless evil. I know that's hard. I know it's hard to say when we say God has a purpose for everything, even the evil acts of men. What he's, I don't know what he's about to get into here, but I, I think it's going to be good because he is uncovering something here that's often straw manned whenever you talk about the sovereignty of God. And he's not just skimming past it. He's addressing it head on with the reality that something, honestly, I, I mean, I, I would not be considered probably reform, reformed by people, but um, the reality of God's sovereignty in all things, which again, Keith is right. It's, it's throughout the scriptures that God is in control of, of all things. All things work together for his, for his good or for our good and his glory. And when you get that, it doesn't make evil less evil or pain less painful, but it does help you understand um, that you can rest in the reality that God is good. So I'm excited to see what's happening here, right? Now, I only pull that out because as we look at all these different sermons that we do reviews on, you can tell the theological bent, either implicitly or explicitly, from the words and the way someone preaches. Now, he just flat out told you he's reformed. This is why he's Reformed. This is why he thinks Reformed theology is beautiful. Sometimes people are not as clear and upfront about it. Um, but this does give you an idea, if you're listening to a pastor, if they're talking about the sovereignty of God, what do they mean by that? Well, Keith is going the extra mile here, not even letting you guess. He's just going to straight up tell you. That's hard. But would you rather step back and say God, has, God just doesn't have any control? Years ago, there was a book written, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? The man who wrote the book came to the conclusion that the reason is, is because there are just some things God doesn't have control over. And if that is your theology, I am sad for you. That if your theology has led you to the point that you believe God just doesn't have control sovereignty over everything now does that make it easy to be reformed no it's hard because we look at the hard things and we say no god had a purpose in this even if we don't know what it is even if we don't know what it is god had a purpose in it and sometimes that's hard amen, amen. but again where do you want to end up do you want to end up with a god who's playing everything by chance Or do you want to trust a God who is sovereign over all and not one molecule in this universe does not obey him? I believe Paul is clear throughout his writings, but particularly in this passage, that God is in fact working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Is that not what Romans 8 says? And is that not impossible to believe if we don't believe God is sovereign? Now, as we walk through this text today, I want to make this point. All of this text can apply to us. But when we study the scripture, and this is again, if you take the hermeneutics class, you're gonna, this is one of the first things. You need to understand who the audience is, you need to understand who the author is, and you need to understand to whom and about whom the author is speaking. And in this text, Paul is talking to the Corinthians about himself and about his companions. Does what he say applies to us? Yes, but it is a secondary application. The primary application is to Paul himself. So this is why I've outlined it this way. The purpose of Paul's weakness, because in verse 7, he's talking about himself. Does it apply to you? Yes, but it's not primarily about you. It's about him. Number two, the purpose of Paul's affliction. That's verses 8 to 12. It's about his affliction and the things that he struggled and the things that his companions and he have endured. See, here's the problem with a lot of Bible study. A lot of Bible study is neither exegesis nor eisegesis. A lot of Bible study is narcissus. You know what narcissus is? When everything's about me, the narcissist makes everything about himself. 
And therefore, every time he opens the Bible, he places the I's and the we's and the S's in referring to himself. That is not always what we should do. I think me and Keith just became best friends. That, uh, yeah, I mean, what are we talking about all the time on this channel? Constantly when we do these German reviews, over and over and over again, at nauseum, right? I mean... The exact thing he just said. Just save that clip and put it on replay every time before you do Bible study. That'll help you a lot. Just exactly what he just said. Of course the scriptures apply. It is a secondary application though. And that makes it no less applicable and no less powerful. But you'll actually understand the scriptures better when you understand who they were written to, why they were written, who's doing the writing, what was the application. I mean, all of those things, if you skip over them, you've just, you've so belittled everything that is being said and made it all about you. Oh my goodness. If I could give you a high five through the screen, Keith, if you ever see this, high five, buddy. High five, brother. Amazing. Keep it up. Keep it up. Not that you need me to tell you to keep it up, but keep it up. We should understand the text in regard to who it's speaking to, who it's speaking of, and then we may make application to ourselves. Only after we have properly understood the audience and the author's intention. Last one, of course, the purpose of Paul's endurance. And whether or not we get to all of this today will be up to the Lord, but we can certainly try. So let's look first at the purpose of Paul's Weakness. This is verse 7. He says in verse 7, But we have this treasure in jars of clay. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Now before we even get to the clause, which is the next word, which is the, the to show that, that's the henna clause there. Let's, let's just look at the first half of the verse. It says, But... Why would it begin with the adversative conjunction? Well, it's because it's contrasting what he said right before this. And what he's talking about right before this is he's talking about having the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That God has said, let this light shine out of darkness. He's shown this light in our heart. What's the comparison? He's comparing that to those who have a veil over their heart, who are unable to see the truth of the gospel, who have not been able to believe because they have this veil of unbelief. And he says, we have this light shining in the darkness. It's shining in our hearts. It gives the light of the knowledge of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand, church? That the very reality of your own conversion and faith is a gift from God. That you did not arrive at your knowledge of God, nor by your faith in God, by happenstance. Think of all of the things that God did to bring you to faith in Him. Maybe it was the family you grew up in, or maybe it wasn't. Maybe you grew up in a family that rejected the Bible. Maybe you rejected the Scriptures, and yet you still came because God sovereignly drew you in, and He placed the light of the knowledge of His Son of God in your heart. Maybe it was recent. Maybe it was 50 years ago. But God did that work. Beloved, we cannot for a second give up our understanding that this is a work of God. Is conversion a supernatural act? Absolutely it's a supernatural act. It's a work of God. This is the work of God that you believe in Him who He has sent. And now we have the adversative conjunction, but. Why but? Here's what He says. But we have this treasure and what's the treasure it's christ it's the gospel it's the message it's the light of the glory of him we have it in jars of clay that's why he said but we've got this tremendous treasure we've got this tremendously valuable thing we've got this pearl of great price this diamond and we have it in an earthen vessel that's the King James rendering. 
We have this treasure in an earthen vessel. What's Paul talking about? He's talking about our weak flesh. And we can bear this out later in the context because twice he uses the word soma, which is body, and once he uses the word sarx, which is flesh. That's literally the context of what he's saying. So when he says jars of clay, he's talking about our weak flesh. He says we are carrying around the greatest treasure in the history of the world in, the, in, in this, this broke up body. I thought, what better, what better time to be limping than preaching this text? Because he says, this is, this is carrying the greatest treasure in the history of mankind. It's, 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 it's all of the gold, all of the silver, all the platinum cannot for an, a moment be compared to the value of the gospel. And any man who would sell his soul for anything this world has to offer is a fool. Because the Bible says what? What does it profit a man that he gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? We have this treasure in jars of clay. Why would Paul compare our flesh, our bodies, to jars of clay? Well, clay jars have two outstanding qualities. Number one, they're weak. And number two, they're cheap. Clay is weak. It's made and it's fired in the oven. And when it comes out, it's brittle and easily broken. How did those boys find those clay pots? They threw a rock and they heard a smash. The clay is weak. But it's also cheap. It's common. It comes from the very dirt of the ground. It's not in itself special. It's not like porcelain, which is weak but valuable. And it's not like iron, which is strong but cheap. It's both weak and cheap. It's, it seems to have very little value in and of itself. And that's Paul's whole point. Is that these bodies of flesh in and of themselves have very little value. That is not to say they have no value at all. Paul talks about the value of the body. He talks about even you exercise as being good for the body and it does have some value, right? So it's not to say it has no value. But the point is the comparison. You don't take a diamond ring and put it in a cardboard box. I, I don't really... I'm not interjecting here, just for those of you that are just listening or just watching. I'm not interjecting a lot because there's not a lot to interject here. Right there's really what he's doing here is exactly what you want him to do. You want him to walk through the text. You want him to unpack what's happening in the text. The only argument that may be made is that we're going like really slow through it. I mean, theoretically, we are an hour and five minutes into the total video, and and that uh, the total video being an hour and forty minutes. So theoretically, he still got <laughs> he still got. 35 minutes left. I don't know if he does or not. I don't know if we're going to use that whole time, but theoretically he's got that much more time to unpack each verse. And so the argument sometimes could be that this type of preaching takes really long, but let's be honest, if you're going to dig into something and learn about it, like really learn about it, sometimes that does take time. There's been sermons we've done on here before where uh, it's like three verses and it takes the entire hour for them to preach it. Um, Again, I understand the argument that it could be shorter. I'm going to try to make this shorter for you by being quiet and letting him keep going. But I did want to interject, right? There's a reason I'm not having to interject every five minutes here because this is exactly what you need to really be looking for in preaching. 
and what it looks like. You don't take a valuable piece of gold, a, a gold bar, and hide it in a pile of hay. But you take valuable things and you put them in places where they are protected. But that is not what God has done with His gospel. God has not taken the gospel and put it in a safety deposit box. He's not taken His gospel and put it into a bank or into Fort Knox or somewhere where it would be protected. No, He has put it in jars of breakable, weak clay. Us. This is Paul's point. We have this massively valuable treasure in this ridiculously weak body. For what purpose? Well, it tells us the purpose. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. That's the purpose. Why would God take the most valuable treasure in all of history and deposit it into weak, cheap vessels? Because in doing so, when that gospel does amazing things, when that light shines and does powerful things, God receives the glory. Now I want to I want to take you into the Old Testament for a moment. You don't have to turn. I just want to remind you of a story because I think it is possible that this may be a story that was on Paul's mind when he wrote this verse. Now I can't prove it from the text, and I am not saying that this text is an Old Testament type or something like that. What I am saying is I think that Paul may have had this on his mind. When he said, we have this light of the gospel, this treasure in jars of clay. If you go back into the book of Judges, you remember there was a man named Gideon. You remember Gideon? Gideon was charged of God to go against the Midianites who had been oppressing the people of Israel. And... At first, he started out with some 30,000 or so troops. And God said, no, we, we're not going to do it that way. Because if you do it that way, it's going to show it's your might and not my might. So let all of them that want to go home, go home. So 20,000 or so, I think it was 22,000, cut out. But he still got 10,000. God said, still too many. Take them down to the creek. This is the Keith version. I mean... Uh, they have creeks in Israel, do they? I guess the river, wherever. Take them down to the brook, the creek. <laughs> Take them down where there's water and, and, and see which guys lap it up like a dog and which guys don't. So it goes from 10,000 down to, remember the last number? 300. Now we got something. We've gone from a massive amount to a very small amount. And does he give them all a sword? No. He gives them a trumpet and a jar. And inside that jar is a torch. And they surround the camp of Midian. Now there's other things that happen. I'm leaving part out of the story. He, he went and he heard a, a, the story of the, the, the uh, dream and gave him confidence that what was going to happen was works of God. There, there are other... I'm, 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 I'm narrowing the story down only to the part that I think is relevant here. Because they go, they circle around the camp. And the people of Midian are there. It's in the dark. And Gideon, at a certain point, he says, Okay, break the jars. What was in the jars? The torch. The light. So when the jars are broken... The people of Midian see all these lights all at once, all around them. They hear the trumpets, they see the lights, they freak out, and they start killing each other. 
They just start, and then they run away. Now you say, why would God do it that way? Why not God send in 30,000 troops with swords and shields? Why would he send 300 guys with a jar and a torch and a trumpet? Because when all was said and done, they could say, God did this. God did this. So when Paul says, we have this treasure in jars of clay. Again, I can't prove that he's thinking about this story of Gideon in the Old Testament, but it certainly seems to resonate that that's a story where God showed his power. And here is Paul saying, we have this tremendous light, this tremendous treasure. It's in a jar of clay. Why? So that God will show his power through us. Beloved, that is the blessing in knowing that God in his grace will show his power through our weakness. God will show his power through our weakness. If you do have your Bibles open to 2 Corinthians, just for a moment, I want you to go over to chapter 12. Hold your place there at chapter 4. But I want you to see that this thought stays in Paul's mind even to the end. This thought of God's weakness being, or I'm sorry, God's strength being shown in Paul's weakness is the theme that continues on. Look with me at verse 9. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. Paul is speaking about God and his word to him. He says in verse 9, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That is the great paradox of the Christian life. That in our weakness, we have strength because our strength is not our own. In our suffering, in our affliction, in our persecution, we have strength that doesn't come from us. We have strength that comes from God. When I am weak, Paul says, then I am strong. Why? Because when I'm weak, I have to rely on Christ. Beloved, I've seen it so many times. You I do want to interject really quick, just so you're not just watching my face agree with everything Keith is saying. Hopefully, hopefully what you're seeing here as he's working through this is the reality that there are other ways that you could say this that might, um, you know, uh, say as simply as like, hey, you know, God gets the glory in every circumstance, or uh, even though you don't do it, God comes through, Right. Um, there, there's a lot of inspiring ways to maybe say this, maybe clickbaity ways to say it, but the reality is when you walk through the text, like he's walking through it and using the context, pulling from other scriptures, demonstrating how this is a tr truth throughout the scriptures, what it does is that we haven't even gotten to the application yet. This is simply saying like, this is what Paul is demonstrating. Now, along with pointing that out and teaching it the way he is, there comes this reality that like, there's already this idea that, well, okay, how, like, that means then that God doesn't change, and so he's ever faithful, and through all these circumstances, he, he remains the same, and so there's already this sort of application that's catching up to us, but we haven't dove head first into it to try to make it about us and everything we're going through, but rather, he's pulling it out within the context, explaining what Paul is saying and how he's saying it, so that you understand like this, the complexity of the situation. So it's not just um, this e easy clickbait title sort of situation where it's like, God's got you no matter what. Okay, how, right? There's a lot of things that people will say that are, 
that that are said in such a way that seem encouraging, you'll leave church really pumped up. But when actual life situations come and hit you, like that encouraging, you know, plat, you know, plateauism. That's not what it is. But that encouraging word that you heard one time, it sounded great, and yeah, it's it's anchored in scripture. But you don't know how it like how it actually applies to your life. When you unpack the scriptures the way that Keith is doing here, you see because you're being taught how that actually applies because Paul was actually saying something when he said these words. He was he was purposely teaching the people he's writing to certain things. And when you understand that and walk alongside of that and see that, you actually have a foundation to stand upon. And it's not just... Uh, 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 you know, a nice phrase that sounds good. It's something that when the hard times actually come, when things actually are, life happens, you're able to understand what the scriptures say and then live them out well. You talk to a person who is wealthy. You talk to a person who is strong. You talk to a person who is healthy and full of vitality about their need for Christ. And often those people will laugh in your face. Why would I need Christ? Look at all that I have accomplished without Him. But the person who is broken, the person who is battered, the person who is at their wit's end and realizes they have nothing is often the person that's ready to receive the gospel because they realize there's no strength in themselves. Nothing in my hand I bring, only to your cross I cling. It's not always that way. Thankfully, the Bible says not many rich. It doesn't say not any rich will be saved. <laughs> There are those who even in their wealth recognize that God is the one who provided. There are those who even in their strength realize that their strength is nothing compared to God's. And there are those who are weak and broken and broke and still don't want Jesus. So I'm not making a blanket statement. But what I am saying is this. Until we realize how weak we are. Until we realize how desperate we are. Until we realize the jars of clay in which we're in, we won't cry out for a saved. It's a desperate condition we're in. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a good person like me. No, that's what many people want to think. But John Newton knew. He said, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Paul understood his weakness. And he understood that in his weakness, he had strength. Because in his weakness, his strength came from God. Now, I just want to go a little further. We're not going to get all the way to verse 15. But I want to show you how the next part ties into this. And then next week we'll bring it together more fully. So go back with me to chapter 4 and verse 8. And let us now look at this as he is now going to describe his weakness. And again, remember, this is Paul. He has, said the, he has said the purpose of my weakness. What is the purpose of my weakness? The purpose of my weakness is to show the surpassing power of God. Now he shows the purpose of his affliction. Notice what he says in verse 8. We, he's speaking of himself and his companions, but certainly could be of us, but we'll, we'll keep it to him and his companions right away. He says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. Beloved, this is a, I think, poetic portion some might even call it a rhetorical portion. Rhetoric is a form of language that's used to, it's used to move 
people. It's used to try to get them to, to think a certain way or to, to go a certain direction in their mind. Politicians are usually skilled in rhetoric. Well, rhetoric is not something that we don't find in the Bible. We actually do find rhetorical use of language in the Bible. And what Paul is doing here is he's saying we are afflicted in every way. Why would he say this? Because he just said, we have this treasure in this clay pot to show the surpassing power of God. And then he says this, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. We see here a parallelism that's going on. He's paralleling his ideas and his thoughts and he's compounding them and he's, he's, he's building, as it were, in music like a crescendo. The first word afflicted there. He says we are afflicted in every way. It comes from the word to press. So certain translation says we... So he's going to walk us through. Okay, I just want to give you... I mean, I, I, think, I think you know what's happening here. And again, maybe I'm just interjecting because I feel the need to interject. Some people have already given up and just clicked the link below and just went to watch the whole thing without this commentary, which I cannot blame them. Um, really. Hopefully though, if you're still here and you're still listening, uh, we can offer some help, uh, and some, um, some, um, maybe education for you. What he's doing here is so helpful. There are going to be people that listen to this and go, well, yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about. I already, I already apply all of this to my Bible study. If that's the case, good on you. You've had somebody that has really helped you understand the need for good, deep Bible study that's really helped you understand how to read the scriptures. Unfortunately, that's just not the case for a lot of people. And so what he's doing here, I think, is not only encouraging the people that know how to do this um, and could do this, like they just know how he's encouraging them by, by doing what he's doing because there's this reassurance that this is how the scriptures should be read. This is what they say. Glory be to God for everything he has done. And then there are people in the audience that just don't know that that's how, and they need to be taught and, and encouraged in that teaching. And that's what he's doing here. Like he's, he's working us through Look, there's so many people that don't think they're intelligent enough. They've been told they're they're ignorant or stupid or not capable to do the very things that Keith is walking his people through right now and saying like, "No, no, you can like there are tools to 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 understand this at a very basic level." Um and to to just see how alive the scriptures are and if you know how to read them, if you know basic basic literature as has for as far as how you're supposed to read basic literature ideas building on other ideas leading to big ideas like if you get that and you read the scriptures that way and you understand that there's there is this pattern that Paul is using like I just hope that like if you don't know if no one's taught you how to do this before that this is helping you understand that the scriptures like there's so much wealth of God's grace and knowledge in them like they are alive. They are so much more applicable than you think they are to your life. So much f more than just like this surf surface application of like, have you ever found yourself in a situation like Paul's talking about? Right. Uh, have you ever went through your, ex <laughs> your own valley? Um, that kind of like, there's so much deeper than that. And hopefully, if, if, you, if you've never heard this type of preaching before, you see that. That there is this, this depth and, of, that, that can be dug up and can be enjoyed and can be learned from. And you can be encouraged by and corrected by. I, I really hope you're getting something from that. We are pressed. There's a song, me and Rachel were singing it before church. It's a song, Trading My Sorrows. It's a... It used to be contemporary. Nothing, nothing I sing is contemporary anymore. Now it's old. But it talks about being pressed but not crushed. And see, the reason why some translators translate it the word pressed because this word for affliction is literally the word for stepping on a grape when you're pushing the grapes down, trying to push the juice out of the grapes to create the grape juice which would be fermented and create wine. 
And Paul says in this analogy, he says, we are pressed, but not crushed. Sometimes we feel crushed. Can't say amen. You better. Because you know it. Some people read this, and, and I honestly think some people say, Paul's got to be talking about himself because he ain't talking about me. Because I know I've been crushed. And I get it. I really, really do. I get the fact that some of you could come up and you could give a testimony from this pulpit that, that you have been crushed by this life. And in this life, there is seemingly nothing in which to find any comfort in the situation that you have been through. But Paul says, and again, hearkening back to what he just said, because of the power of God, you are still here and you're still saved and you're still in God's hand and he still has you and you are not yet crushed. Being pressed does not feel good. Amen. I think I told the story recently. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. But I have a tremendous fear of enclosed spaces. I truly do. I have terrible claustrophobia. And they tried to put me in an MRI machine. I had to figure out another way. <laughs> Because when I went in, I felt like I was being crushed. And it wasn't even touching me. It wasn't even on me. But I felt like my whole body was under a constraint of a weight that I couldn't take. And it wasn't even touching me. Beloved, we can feel crushed. Paul says we're pressed but not crushed. Why? Because God is sustaining us. God is sustaining you. Pressed but not crushed. Perplexed but not driven to despair. Perplexed literally means to be without resources, to be in doubt, to be utterly embarrassed by a lack of knowledge. You ever been there? You just can't figure it out. You don't know why. He's I th here, here's something that I think is also coming through in this sermon. As I said before, this sort of preaching really brings the... It, it doesn't try to skate past the reality of pain. Um, in fact, he, he's bringing out the scripture so that you can understand life circumstances through the reality of scripture and what Paul is saying here. And so he's pressed on this a few times, like the reality in, in not trying to like kind of shy away from it as much as he's trying to directly push into it, that life is hard. There are situations in life that are going to be incredibly hard and you've probably been there and you don't feel like it's a good thing. You don't feel like you've come out on the other side real great. You don't feel like um, you're not crushed. And so by digging into these things and not making them like surface level, everything's going to be great. Don't worry about it. You're not crushed. Um, he's really leaning into the, the, the reality that there are people in his congregation. And as a pastor, you know this. As a pastor, you're fully aware of um, a good number of the troubles that your congregation is going through. And so he's sort of hitting that head on and like knowing that there is pain and there is pressure and there are things that people are going through that they don't want to go through. And in his unpacking of the text is slowly bringing the text together with the application uh, without making the entire application about you, but rather saying there are things that you should know as a believer from what Paul writes here to his... Um, to his friends and his family in the faith in Corinth. And when you understand them, the reality of that truth actually is far more beneficial um, than trying to make it about you right off the right out of the gate.
He said, but even in that, you don't, you're not in despair. Why? Because I know why. Persecuted, but not abandoned. King James and the ESV say forsaken, but I like abandoned because that really is the modern way. that we, we don't usually use the word forsake anymore, but we do use the word abandoned. And this is what people think. They say, I'm being persecuted, therefore God is not with me. But God is with you. He has not left you. He has not forsaken you. He has not gone away from you. In fact, He's closer to you than He's ever been. When Jan Hus was being burned at the stake for preaching the gospel of Christ, he died singing. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And those were the last words people heard as the very breath was pulled from his chest as the flames came around his body. Persecuted but not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. The word struck down, the root of that word is the Greek word balo. And it's one of the easy words that I remember because... It means to throw, and you think if you throw the ball, oh, <laughs> hey, I do it my way, you do it your way. <laughs> but literally, the Greek word balo means to throw, and this word literally means to be thrown down. Thrown down, but not destroyed. Beloved, I can't help but think this has to be one of the most beautiful things that Paul ever wrote outside of Romans 8, 28 to 32. And we're going to read that in a moment. But just think of what he's saying here. He's saying in your affliction, you're not crushed. In your perplexion, you're not driven to despair. In your persecution, you're not abandoned. And in being thrown down, you're not destroyed. Because the power of God through the Lord Jesus Christ lives within you by His Holy Spirit. And you have Him. Therefore, you have the power that gives life to these jars of clay. So as we close, let us hear Paul's words in Romans 8. I said verse 28, I meant verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him, us, gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am certain that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven. All right, so he's going to end in prayer. That brings us to an hour and 26 minutes of a sermon that's an hour and 39. I'm not sure what would be after that, but let's go ahead back over to this screen. Um, let's go over the three things we look at in every sermon. Did he read the text? 100% he did. Did he exegete that text? 100% he did. And did he preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yes, he did. And so 
it's one of those things that we, we currently live in an internet age that is very, very easy to go through and just just find every terrible sermon there is under the sun, right? By the time this sermon comes out, or by the time the sermon review comes out, it's probably like four or five, six days removed from a sermon um, that like everybody and their brother had a comment on where somebody, some rando that nobody's ever heard of before, uh, preached a sermon on, does God worship us, right? Those are really easy. And nothing against anybody that did that review or, or commented or made content about that sermon. It's a trash sermon. Terrible doctrine like that should be pointed out. I want to try to make it an effort here, though, that not only do we call out really trash like that, but we also talk about great, great presentations of sermons like we just saw from Keith. Because it can be really easy to get discouraged by the nonsense that is out within Christianity today, progressive Christianity, um, especially, um, or just or just Christianity that makes it all about more, you know, some sort of white knuckling morals, just do all the right stuff. What we're really looking for are pastors that read the scriptures. We're looking for pastors that dig into those scriptures and demonstrate how they are alive, they're applicable, they're relevant, they, they do apply to your life. It's just a secondary application and it's just as powerful. And they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. What, what we saw Keith do here in this sermon was to give us the background that we need to understand in case we didn't know coming in who Paul's talking to, why he's talking to them, give us a little background leading up to the chapter we're covering, and then dive really deeply into the text and really bringing out the reality of the fact that Things will happen in life. Things were happening in life. Paul knows that. But when he writes to people he loves, he tells them about these things to encourage them, even in bad times. And when he does that, right, he's able to encourage them through his very suffering, through the things that he was going through. I mean, we have it right there in the text. I mean, he's, he's read it, but it says, but we have these treasures in jars of clay that show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. That whole point that, that Keith made, hopefully that excited you, right? The reality that God chooses to use us as vessels in which to declare his goodness is amazing. Like that should encourage you. That God chooses to do it this way, and he gets the glory from it the entire time. And yeah, you could have said it a million different ways. Could have said it in like in like pithy, poppy ways with just kind of referring to the text but not reading it. But when Keith, again, digs into it and demonstrates what Paul is saying here, why he's saying it the way he is, and then moving on to sort of demonstrating like, um, in, 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 the, in the following verses when he says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Right? That there is a reality that, that Paul gets that. And then when we understand that he is, he is coming from a position that understands that and still relying on the Lord, there is this same sort of thing that happens when we read the text and understand that it is real and alive and applicable, that it's very similar to when you see somebody going through something and they're able to persevere through. That encourages you to do the same thing. And so when we read this scripture, understand what it's saying, why Paul's saying it that way, we too can be encouraged by it. We're not declaring, well, yeah, we're definitely going to get through it. God's going to give us everything we need, everything we want. But we can be encouraged by the reality that we're, we're not crushed. We're not abandoned. Even in the darkest of those times, he's still there. And he's choosing to use these, these jars of clay to declare the goodness of the gospel. I, ju I just, I hope you see, like, I know sometimes it can get very like, oh, you're just kicking a dead horse saying the same thing over and over again. When it is, when the scriptures are preached rightly, they are alive, 
They are powerful. They are encouraging. They are convicting. They are correcting. They do the things that they are meant to do. It's so that you can grow in righteousness. And hopefully, today, going through this sermon helped you do that as well. If it did, leave a like. If you need know somebody that uh, wouldn't be encouraged by this or could learn from this, send it to them. And check out the links below. I'll talk to you next week.